I think of it a little bit like uh, hell. Most people, when they get sick, they don't think what they did that got them sick in the first place, or vulnerable in the first place. They just want a pill. They be well. And it, it can make your cold feel better, you know, but it, it's just depressing. The symptoms, you can feel better, but you haven't finished cold. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and we, we have in medicine today because, I believe, because um, one particular philosophy of medicine has um, gotten a monopoly over medical practice. I don't know what it's like in India, but in the United States, it's the American Medical Association, and their solutions are chemistry and cut, you know, surgery. <coughs> That's the solution for things. And they outlawed other philosophies of medicine that are much more holistic, uh, naturalistic. Uh, homeopathic and naturopathic uh, philosophies of medicine were starting to, to blossom in the United States, and they were all outlawed. Well, that means that we're not really then focused in on what causes the illness in the first place. We're focused only on that immediate remedy. And then we don't really think around it afterwards, we're just uh, treating the symptoms. It's the same way in economics. Uh, in my view, the, other, the, the Australian, I mean, the Keynesian and Montreal schools of thought are cut in chemistry, ways of responding to the problems that people see without seeing what the cause of those problems were and without really solving the problem in the future, just simply putting a bandaid on it and making it look better for right now. You know. um, for example, in our current economic uh, crisis in the West, uh, massive increases in credit through single banking are things that build up to these huge bubbles. And then the collapse is inevitable. How do they respond? The Keynesians respond by massive deficit spending, the monetarists by massive creation of money. Well, it makes it look good, but it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't really analyze what caused the problem in the first place. So the Austrian perspective, um, by saying no to the Keynesian and monetarist perspective, they appear to be saying, oh, you're not really doing anything. But they are doing something. They're saying, don't cause the problem in the first place. Um, now, there's another illustration. It's not just credit expansion. It's credit aversion from wise investment to what we call malinvestment, bad investment. So let me give this illustration the way I often illustrate it in my uh, uh, classes. Suppose that you represent Bank Secure. <coughs> you put your money into sound and secure investments where people have good credit rating, good uh, cash flow, good collateral, and, um, and you are deciding where you're going to put your money. You're going to put your money into this bank or to this bank. Now this bank um, puts the big loan their money out to subprime customers, people with very bad cash flow. They don't have any income or very bad credit rating. They never paid off their, their interest in the past. Uh, or bad um, uh, cash flow, credit rating, and uh, collateral. We don't really have any. That doesn't mean that, it, that this thing that you're going to loan your money to isn't possible to succeed. It could be. But they're more risky. When you're putting money into they're less risky. So when we decide where are you going to put your money, people have a different attitude towards risk in themselves. Some people will put their money here. Some people will put your money here. Okay. But now some. Suppose that we come along and I say, I'm the government central bank, and I'm going to remove all risk and put it under the taxpayer. Now, you don't have to worry about whether your money is going to go uh, fail or succeed. You're going to go where you're going to pay the highest interest. Now, this person, because you're putting money into secure things, they will pay low interest because they can shop around for the best interest rate. But these people who you put your money into have to pay a high interest rate because they're more risky. So now, if you're deciding where do you put your money, the risk has been taken off to somebody else. In other words, the risk has been socialized to the taxpayers. But all you have to worry is about which is the gain. You're going to say, well, I'll put my money where this is the greatest gain. So people take their money out of this institution, because it's low interest, and put their money a huge amount into this institution, which is high interest, because you don't have to worry about the risk. This is called moral hazard. The problem moral hazard occurs when the government removes the risk side of the equation for the investor 
and people behave more recklessly than they otherwise would. If you don't have to consider risk, the risk is put on somebody else, then you behave recklessly. And that's what happened with the housing bubble. Huge amount of money into the housing market. Huge amount of money into um, the stock market. Um, and very little money for home mortgages and small businesses and, and um, some of the secure investments. Well, then this level collapses because there aren't enough customers to make these businesses succeed. But you use your political power to keep me bailing you out because you're so too, too big to fail. So we keep using more and more taxpayers' money to keep propping up institutions that should have gone co collapse. And when they go collapse and they uh, go bankrupt, it doesn't mean they go out of existence. It means that they go from bad managers and owners to bad to managers and owners who feel they can do a better job. And the Austrians say, don't bail them out, and don't get involved with absolving people of risk in the first place, because that created the bubble. Instead, um, let people alone, let people be responsible for their own decisions, and they are much more likely to behave wisely, with much less maladministered, much less bad investment, when they're in charge of their own risk and reward. And that's where I think the Austrians differ from the Keynes and Montres uh, in this approach to creating problems and, and responding afterwards. So it seems like in the long run, um, it depends on where you start your run. Are you looking at when it began or when you see the crisis happen? You know? So the Austrians uh, say that the, the Great Depression was caused in the 1920s, when they built up this huge credit bubble in the first place. And the Keynesians and, and the Marxists say, oh, well, it started right here with the market fund. You know, and uh, so on. And so. surveys in my classes about corruption. Yeah. How many of my own students, you know, there's a case of a guy who was the mayor of Detroit, mm -hmm. and he took bribes and uh, to give favors. And he was, he was finally caught and convicted and sent to jail. I asked my class, well, was it right that he got convicted? Yes. Why? Well, it's stealing. Separately from that, a little bit of time passage that I gave that little survey. Suppose you are in a position to accept a million dollars, and you can decide, you're a politician who can decide on what the price of bread is. And you have a chance to raise the price of bread one penny per loaf of bread for the whole country. Um, and somebody's going to pay you a million dollars to vote that way. And it's totally risk-free completely secret. Nobody will know. And it's uh, and risk-free, meaning nothing will happen to you negatively. You know, it's, we'll even consider that it's not even against the law. Would you do it? By a show of hands, 95% of my students said yes. Now, I don't know if that surprises you, but it, it always surprises me. In a sense, it doesn't surprise me anymore because all my surveys are always the same. And <laughs> yes. There's 5% that say no. And that's but I'll get to later, but that's the most interesting 5%. So then I say, okay, well, it's, it's not secret. Everybody will know, but it's still risk-free. No penalty, but, but it's uh, not secret. How many will take the billion dollars to raise the price of bread for everybody across the country? Now, in the United States, I calculate, okay, if that's a penny per loaf of bread and $10 per person per year, 300 million people, that's about $3 billion. So that's a lot of money to the guy that's paying you $1 million. You get, they get $3 billion. And everybody in the country sees only a penny of uh, increase in the price of bread. Would, would they do it? And I would give would be Estonia, yeah. Chile. New Zealand, um, Botswana, Mauritius. Which of them similar to India, you would say? Oh, well, no. I, I, uh, I mean, 
India is an enormous country with yeah. tremendous uh, diversity within the country. Yeah. Uh, I mean, every country is unique in their own situation. But I, you, you could say that, um, well, and, you know, Hong Kong mm. and Singapore are in, in, in Asia. I mean, they're, they're a, an oasis of people who have moved to that because they're moving away from the corruption and tyranny across the border. And what they found, generally speaking, they, they were going there. I mean, really, the, the true measure of where the greatest freedom is is where people walk. Mm. And, um, you know, when they're allowed to walk. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would, I mean, they, they are countries that did have reform against corruption, but instead of greater controls, they introduced uh, the way to cut the, the price of water was to open up competition in those bidding, bidding for the, 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 the contract. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is the way to cut the, 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 yeah. the way for electricity is to open up the competition for the bidding yeah. for the who was offering the best service. Now you can put into the contract all the specifications and your quality insured in the contract or else you lose the contract. Mm -hmm. But it opened up to the world to compete, mm. not just the local magnets, but uh, the world to compete on who can offer the lowest price at the best quality. So. Uh, then you could cut the electricity mm. and have it be done in an efficient way, I think. Mm. I always think of New Zealand as a very positive outcome. You know, the 
the Labour Party made some very tough decisions to, to change radically. And this book uh, by Sarangi Dutt was called Unfinished Business Explains His Game Plan. Moving in quantum leaps very fast so that the opposition can't, can't rally enough to, to stop uh, radical free market reforms, freedom reforms. Um, but also, okay, trust the population to understand what you're doing. In other words, don't sell the public short. If you explain things correctly in politics, what you're trying to accomplish and how you're doing it, they can understand the concept. For example, everybody knows that if you want to go to college, you have to set aside some of your personal spending today so that in the future you've got savings that go to your, you know, you can pay your university tuition. Everybody understands that on a personal level. And then they say, well, it's the same thing with the, with the country. You can't spend everything today and not expect to have what you want for future um, uh, progress in your, in your development. 